lecture, I'm going to say quite a bit of what I said in the previous two, but just kind of put them together a bit um, and think about the two policies together. So um, I'm going to think about how, the pol how they interact. So what happens if we both um, want to think about implementing a tax and an advertising uh, ban or advertising restriction? I won't consider a full ban. Um, but also, even in the absence of doing both, I'm interested in how um, the fact that firms advertise, so if you implement a tax, advertising affects the shape of demand, and if we change prices, that may shift firms up the demand curve or down the demand curve, and so the way that advertising firms may re-optimize on advertising. And so we want to think about the way advertising um, affects the shape of the demand curve, so we can think about the interaction between policies that shift prices and, and advertising um, accounting for the effects on each other. So what's going to be new in this, I'm going to do all the things I did in the previous lectures, think about, importantly think about what the shape of demand is and how we want that to reflect um, the key aspects of the market that are going to be important for what we want to look at. So here I'm going to be thinking about the cola market, Coke and Pepsi basically, and so uh, in every, you know, so one of the things I've been trying to emphasize is that there's not one good right demand model. The demand model that's right is the one that's right for what you're doing. So that depends both on the nature of the market you're looking at, but also what you want to study. So um, I was liking it to the tube map. The tube map is a really good map uh, if you want to get from one place to another, but it's a really rubbish map. The tube map of London, sorry. The London tube map is kind of famously very abstract. It's really good if you want to get somewhere on the tube, but it's really rubbish if you want to ride your bike around London because it's completely um, doesn't represent the reality of where locations are. So I think a model is a lot like that. It's not like there's one model that you want. If what you want to do is get around on the tube, then the tube map's great. If what you want to do is you know, cycle from one place to another, the tube map's rubbish. And so the same thing is true for models that you want the model that allows you to answer the question that you're interested in answering. And that's not always going to be the same model in every case. So, uh, and, and then the, uh, more importantly, the thing that we'll do is think about um, dynamic supply side. So in the last model I wrote down, in the last lecture, I wrote down a fully dynamic supply side model. But then I kind of cheated because I just said, oh, I just want to consider shutting off advertising so I don't need to solve any of the dynamics. So now what I want to say is, well, actually, what if that's not the policy I want to think about? What if I want to think about like a partial restriction on advertising? So like in the case of colas, that's going to be restrictions on advertising sugary varieties, but not diet. Then I have to solve the dynamic game. That's going to turn out to be completely impracticable to solve the full dynamic game, but it's going to turn out that there's some institutional features of the way that advertising works that's going to allow us to do that. Um, and so that's another nice trick that's going to allow us to, to solve the model. So um, uh, the motivation is kind of very related to what we've said before. Taxes are commonly levied on sin goods, goods like alcohol, tobacco, sugary drinks. These markets typically have a small number of multi-product firms, as we've seen, that sell differentiated products, and they often spend a lot on advertising. And because advertising potentially affects the shape of demand, both today and into the future, um, firms both may respond to taxes by adjusting advertisements, advertising expenditures, meaning that the introduction of a tax will have dynamic effects in the new market equilibrium. And we might want to account for that if we're just interested in taxes on their own. But then, of course, we may also be interested in other policies that restrict advertising too. So the other thing I should say about this paper is that it's, um, it's incredibly new. The results are, you'll see, not entirely finished and uh, in progress as we speak. So I'm not going to have, I'll, I'll have some, I'll have results and I think they're the right results, but you know, it's new and they may change and I'll kind of get a bit wishy-washy as we get to the end. The point is not to tell you the answer to the question, it's to illustrate to you how you can sort of approach this problem empirically and kind of tricks of the trade for making progress on what looks like a really intractable uh, problem when we start out. Okay, and so this is work with um, a PhD student, Rossi 
um, Abi Rafa, who now has gone to work for Deliveroo, because uh, he was so good on this paper, uh, and Pierre and Martin, as before. Okay, because because a lot of what I'll say has been similar to what I've said before, and because you've all been here and there's not that many of you, I probably won't talk for the full hour and a half unless you ask a lot of questions, but we'll just stop when we naturally get to a stopping place. Um, so, how, what are, what's the impact of a tax allowing for firms' advertising responses, and how do taxes compare to advertising restrictions? So actually the answer to that is going to turn out to be quite surprising. So when we started this project, like all projects, the answer is never what you think. I thought that advertising restrictions in the soda market were going to be really have a big effect and taxes would have a small effect. We're going to find, so right now the results are the opposite of that, that banning advertising has a very small effect. It doesn't have the effect that we saw in the last case, as I said before. There's not going to be, firms aren't going to lower prices, they're actually going to slightly increase prices um, and we can I can talk about why we why that we get that result um, it's a different case we're not banning advertising we're restricting advertising so that's one reason it's different but there's other re the shape of demand is different too so that's different so what we're gonna do is write down a dynamic oligopoly model uh, which is kind of similar to what we wrote down before with a few different decisions advertising is going to enter in a little different way because the different nature of the product mm -hmm. And then importantly, as I said, so what, so the kind of data we have is the data that we had in the last paper and that the, is commonly, is, is now more common to be used. So we have individual level ads. Uh, so firms potentially dynamic problem is to choose. So like Coke and Pepsi advertised, there's a million adverts over the couple years that we consider. <coughs> so <coughs> if we think about the dynamic problem, if you wrote the full dynamic problem out, firms are deciding a million different choices about exactly when to show an ad, at what time, etc. That problem's completely intractable for us to solve. Uh, it's intractable for the firm to solve, we're gonna argue. And so, in practice, what you see firms doing is using um, advertising agencies. So the way the advertising industry works is that firms contract with an advertising agency and they say I'm going to give you this budget million quid I want you to get 10,000 pairs of eyes to see my adverts so the advertising agency then has the problem of like max either you can think of as maximizing impacts given that budget or minimizing costs given the number of eyes and so that's going to make our problem so we um, I won't do it here but in the paper we write down uh, we show that that's an optimal strategy for the firm to follow under some conditions. And so we're going to use that to really reduce the, the action space of the firm. What firms are going to do now is just simply decide their advertising budget. They're not going to individually decide every one of the adverts that they show. They may also, and we, the model that we write is consistent with this, I won't talk about it really, but they may also say, I want... Uh, you know, I want a thousand eyes seeing my advert and I want 50% of them to be kids and 30% to be women and 20% to be pensioners. So that we'll have those weights in. I won't talk about those a lot, but it's perfectly possible that firms, uh, that, that that's allowed in the model. So that's an example again, as I said before, like we write down this, um, if, you, if you write down the firm's problem, thinking of the full dynamic model, it's completely intractable. So like in the last one where we thought, oh, well, there's no way that we can think of advertising restrictions because we'd have to solve this complicated dynamic game. Ah, oh, but we could, if we go to zero advertising, we, the dynamics disappear and we can solve that. Here, it's like, oh, if we think of firms as contracting out this decision to a, another, to a specialist agency, which is in fact the way the industry works, we then get to a tractable model under some assumptions. So we need to be really careful about what those assumptions are and how they might matter for what we are doing. And when we do counterfactuals in particular, we will have to make some assumptions about the behavior of the agencies not changing, but we can argue why those are plausible or not. Uh, and so we're gonna look at the cola segment of the UK drinks market. So basically Coke and Pepsi, and there'll be some own brand cola products. I keep on going the wrong way. Okay, so before we do that, I just want to write down like a really simple model to get, because this, the model is going to get really complicated very quickly and have 
multiple dimensions and be hard to look at. I will show you some aspects of it, but um, it's useful to start with a just much simpler model to gain some intuition about one, what the main factors at play are going to be here. So to gain some intuition, let's just look at a simple monopoly example. That's not what I'm going to be estimating. I'm going to be estimating an oligopoly model where we have the firms, multi-product firms competing in, um, in, in advertising and pricing. But if we just simplify it, I can write it down in two dimensions and show you some of the key things that are going on. So we think about a simple monopolist that's choosing prices and advertising, has some marginal cost that includes some fixed marginal cost and then some tax that's levied on top of that. And then we have some fixed cost of advertising. So the monopolist is going to choose price and advertising to maximize its profits. Um, and so one thing that is going to be interesting that we can draw, we can talk about the scale of this markup, which will be like the extent to which when the tax is applied, the firm passes that tax on to consumers. So in general, in like monopoly or oligopoly models, it won't be optimal for a firm to pass on the tax necessarily 100%. It might underpass it through, so it might raise prices by less than the tax, or might overpass it through, might raise them by more, depending on the shape of demand at that place. So what we can look at, just to give you some intuitions, I'll draw pictures in what the firm's choice of markup is relative and, and how that relates to ad the advertising. So the optimal advertising choice is going to equate the marginal revenue from an additional unit of advertising with the marginal cost. We just write that expression. Okay, so let's start by just assuming Monopolist has a fixed margin, so it doesn't adjust prices, um, and then look at what, um, sorry, it doesn't it adjust prices, but it 100% pass through, so it has a fixed margin. So tax increases the price, that means the firm moves up the demand curve. So then what's going to matter for how it responds in terms of advertising is going to be if consumers are more or less responsive to advertising at that point that it's moved up the demand curve. Um, if, the, if, ad, if consumers are more um, responsive, then it's going to lower advertising. If they're less responsive, it's, uh, sorry, if, if they're more responsive, it'll increase it. And if it's less responsive, it'll raise it. So, um, so we can just think of this really simple model where we have uh, quantity and price and then a, the marginal cost. The tax is introduced and it shifts up the marginal cost. This quantity is a function of price and advertising. We have a fixed marginal cost, so the tax just shifts the price up. So whether or not the monopolist is going to lower or increase advertising is going to depend on how the responsiveness of consumers change as it shifts that way up the, um, the demand curve. So we estimate this, it's going to be a demand curve that's in multiple dimensions, and I'm not going to draw it, but just intuitively, one of the things that's going to happen is as the firm has shifted up the demand curve, you're going to have different types of consumers, and those consumers may either be more or less responsive to taxes, uh, to advertising, and that's going to affect how the firm responds in advertising. And so that will be one important factor, and we want to make sure that when we specify demand, we allow for that effect. We allow for the responsiveness of consumers and advertising to change in that respect. But of course, monopolists are also going to, a choice is, price is also a choice, so we also want to allow them to adjust their margin. And so the second factor at play is going to be if a firm raises its margin, that increases the profitability of the marginal consumer. Right? So if a firm uh, has a, a low markup and then it shifts to a higher markup, the uh, profitability of that marginal consumer is higher. And all else equal, the firm is then going to have incentives to raise advertising because it wants to attract that consumer because it's a higher value consumer. Right? And then the vice versa will be true. If they're, less, um, if they're less profitable, then it will have less incentives to advertise. So it's going to be like the interplay of those effects that's going to, that we want to make sure we reflect in the, in the demand specification. And then when we look at how, um, how, that, how the new equilibrium comes out, we can start. So, so one thing in these dynamic models is they're often these crazy black boxes that a ton of stuff is going on. And you see some change happen, but it's all in multiple dimensions. And it's really hard to see exactly what's driving it. And so our aim here is to start from a really simple model understand what the forces at play are, 
then add some stuff and think about how that's going to be affecting those forces or mitigating them. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's just a picture showing you what I just showed you. So that's like the really simplest monopoly example. Um, in, the, in that case, what it's um, the effect of a, a, the impact of a tax on advertising is it depend on the sensitivity to demand for advertising and how that changes along the demand curve, and then how tax impacts profitability of marginal consumers. So we're going to want to make sure, for example, that we have a specification that's rich enough to allow for variation in responsiveness to advertising along the demand curve. We're going to write down a differentiated product market in which a bunch of other forces are going to be at play too. So there's going to be the dynamic effects due to the long-lasting impact of advertising. So it's going to affect not just today but into the future. They're going to be multi-product firms. So there's going to be some kind of spillovers if I advertise Diet Coke, that may have effects on Coke, um, and, and um, there'll be other you know, interactions between the firm's pricing, etc. And then there'll be competitors' actions, so if Pepsi does something, Coke will respond. So all of those factors will be at play. It's, it gets insanely messy if you try to start solving the model and writing all those down. Um, they be, they, there's very, it's very hard to get intuition in those kind of oligopoly models for what's actually happening because lots of factors are at play. So it's really hard to get any, you know, to, to write down something simple that allows you to look at some intuitive factors that are driving things. Um, but we know that those initial factors will be important. Okay, so for the latter two, for the multi-product firm and for the competitors' actions, it's going to depend a lot on whether advertising is stealing market share or, um, and so we want again to be careful that we allow for that, that, adver that adver the effect of advertising can be just for Coke and Pepsi to take market share from each other or for it to move people in and out of the market. And also it's going to depend on the extent to which advertising for one product spills over onto another product. So we were talking about that before, if I advertise Diet Coke, does that just lead to people shifting from Diet Pepsi to Diet Coke, or does it lead to people shifting into the market as well, away from milk or something? And so we want to make sure that our demand model has all those factors in it. So we're going to study the UK cola market and allow firms to choose price and advertising budgets. Um, advertising is going to have this dynamic effect. And then advertising agencies are going to act as this intermediate, intermediary that optimize advertising spots, individual ads, on behalf of the firm given the budget. And so that reduces the firm's problem from having to choose over all these many, many thousands and hundreds of thousands of advertising spots to a much more tractable decision that's just deciding its advertising budget today. And so that's a big restriction. So we get that from reading information about the advertising literature. So Greg Crawford in particular, other economists, have done quite a lot of work on the way advertising works. And these advertising agencies, this is you know, very much in line with the way the industry works. So of course we are imposing some additional structure like that, um, that the, when we do the counterfactual, we have to make some additional assumptions that the way agencies work doesn't change. Um, but we'll argue that that's probably not too restrictive. OK, so again, like before consumers choose which product to buy and their choice is influenced by the stock of advertising, um, plus some other characteristics, Coke and Pepsi are pretty simple goods. So it's just going to be brand and um, pack size and sugar. Um, but the effect of advertising is going to depend, as it was before, on this idea of the individual viewing habits of the um, consumer, which we'll have detailed data on about whether they watch you know, Britain's Got Talent or X Factor. So like, we, uh, we observe at the individual level the types of shows they p habitually watch. And we're going to like compare people that sort of randomly w one, watch one show versus another show of shows that have very similar demographic audiences. So the purchase data is the same as we used before, the Kantar purchase data. Um, households record all grocery transactions, prices, quantities, etc. And it's longitudinal, and so that again, that's going to be very useful for identifying both 
the preference parameters with respect to price, but also very importantly with respect to advertising, because we'll see individuals facing different uh, advertising shocks and we'll see individuals making different, facing different prices in different settings. I didn't talk about this a lot before, but the way that we get that, Kantar ask a whole battery of questions about people's regular TV viewing behavior, including the, um, how often you watch like the most popular 200 TV shows. So it's quite granular. I'm going to work with hmm? information on which shows show which Coca-Cola or Pepsi. That's uh, so that comes from AC Nielsen, so we buy that data. So it lists every individual advert and then the time of day and the show before and the show after. Uh, so the cola market is quite a simple market. That's one reason. Um, so these dynamic games are complicated both in the state space of the decision making, but so the more firms you have, the more complicated the state space is. And so it's kind of hard. So already this takes a long time to solve. The more firms and actors there are, the more complicated it gets. Um, those we were talking about before, I always think saying something's computationally hard just shows how stupid you are, not how hard the problem is. <laughs> but, um, but I think this is a hard problem. So uh, Coke is by far the dominant firm. It has, um, we're, we're gonna focus on the cola market, so not other, other soft drinks, but. And so there's a, a regular variety and a diet variety, and then Pepsi has regular. And then there's some store brands, but they're very small market share. And we don't find the same effect here that when they, like we did in crisps, that when advertising reduces, we don't see so much con substitution to those. Uh, the, the different brands have different numbers of products, which are basically different pack sizes, so cans and bottles and small and large varieties. So the advertising data is uh, from AC Nielsen. It's spot data, um, so we have about over 100 over one million adverts over the uh, like 15 odd years that we study um, and they have the very granular data on exactly when it was shown and um, and then for the consumers we have information about the shows they watch the stations they habitually watch what times they watch at and in the advertising data we also have information on the agencies that they used and the price they paid for the advert well the expenditure so we can get price from knowing the minutes that they bought um, in addition, I'll, I'll refer to this in a minute, we get information, so it turns out when we, uh, when, we, when we use the data, when we're translating the data into um, exposure, the other thing, so, so the consumers or the people in the Kantar data are asked, do you regularly um, sometimes never watch this show? So we have to translate that into a probability of actually seeing the show. That doesn't, we don't know how to, we don't know the what does regularly mean in terms of a probability of viewing it. So we have information from uh, the people who run like set-top boxes on top of TVs, so they know exactly who's watched which show. So for one year we have that information, and so we can use that to estimate the empirical probability of having seen a show given you said you regularly watch it. Okay, so individual consumers' exposure to advertising is going to be uh, the sum of over, so this I is consumer, K is an individual advert, and this is the length. So we actually do all of this in seconds. Most adverts are the same length, so actually it doesn't really matter that much that we do it in seconds, but you could think of this as just an advert. So um, this is the probability that the consumer saw the advert, and then this is going to be some function of um, the amount of seconds you saw the advert. So we're gonna estimate this function later on and we're gonna assume it's concave, so we're basically gonna assume that the more you see, the less of an effect it has. The first few seconds of advertising you see have a bigger effect on your um, behavior than later um, seconds. Okay, so, so what I was just talking about was we have to estimate this W function, what's the probability that you saw this? given that we have this data that says I regularly watch Britain's Got Talent. Um, and so we use this BARB data uh, on the population to estimate those Ws. And so we get, um, there's just a bit of information about that. One thing that's interesting, so this is the million shows we have. So the million adverts we have. 
So we only match, of the million, we match 20% of them, we observe the shows either side. So that's a reasonably small number, that's the, that's the most accurate piece of information. Um, but most of them we just know, I, I, I regularly watch TV uh, at seven o'clock at night and I regularly watch ITV. You know, that would be what station and slot means. However, when you look at these adverts, these shows are the um, most popular shows. So they ask people about the 200 most popular shows. So they account for by far the bulk of, of adverts in terms of the impact of those adverts. So if you look at the, um, the total amount of expenditure on those 20% of ads compared to these ones that we don't match so well, this, the, these 20 account for uh, a large, oh, close to 50% of the share of the expenditure. So even though we're not matching very many, we're matching the ones that people are most likely to be watching. So the most important ads that are the most expensive ads um, and that are most likely to be watched. Okay. So I, I, I go into this in some detail because this is amazing data compared to what most people have in this literature. So mostly people will have just like aggregate expenditure of the, of, the, um, of the company and just assume that consumers see it with some probability without having information on that. So we, we're, we're doing quite well at really able to match people that intense the probability of treatment from the advertisement. Um, and so get really granular level variation in, in advertising exposure that's kind of unusual to, to have. Okay, so then the brand, but from the firm side, what the firm is to say, yeah. Uh, because the time slot's too aggregate. So if it was 7.25, but like TV ads are 30 seconds. So in the ad data, we have that ad was shown at you know, 7.32 and 30 seconds. In the, in the consumer data, we have, did you watch TV between seven and eight last night? Oh, I see, so show is there, not show, show is the ad show. No, show is TV shows. I regularly watch Britain's Got Talent. And when in the advert, we said it was shown at 7.45, which was in the middle of Britain Got Talent or just before Britain's Got Talent or just after. We know the position it is in the show. So we can say if you regularly watch Britain's Got Talent, you have a higher probability of seeing it. And so we put more weight on that when we estimate these Ws. We put more weight on that than if you say, I typically watch TV between 7 and 8 and I typically watch... ITV, which is the st st station that shows that. So you don't we, drop the we don't drop them, we just have a low, it's a lower probability. You know, we're just like, what's, what's the probability that you saw the show? Yeah. What, you saw the ad? If you watch that show, the probability, it's like 0.56 or something, it's like quite high. Whereas if you just watch TV at that time, yeah. it's like 0.4 or something. So those probabilities, do you have to handwrite or do you use none of that? Because we use this data, so in this, in this BARB data for one year, we know for every ad how many people saw it. And we know that by demographic group. We have different data which we bought that says this particular ad was seen by uh, 55 uh, old, you know, old women, 43 young women, whatever. And so we use that year to, with the information on what consumers said that, to estimate those probabilities to match the moments of those two distributions. Yeah. So we're able to get, I think, a pretty good match for that of what those probabilities mean. So that that's like quite unusual to have that kind of both of those types of data. It's getting harder, no? Netflix, that kind of... Oh, yeah, so streaming is, so we're lucky. Exactly, it's getting much harder now because streaming... Yeah, so streaming. So we have, um, well, Netflix doesn't have ads, of course. So, so we know whether you're watching um, those, and they, but they don't have ads on them. Yeah, so social media, we don't have at all. And this is, in this period, social media is not so important. But now, of course, it's very important. Yeah, yeah. But, but watching, um, what, like streaming, watching with delay is complicated because you don't necessarily see the ads in the same way. So this is a period of time before that. So TV advertising is still, like firms spend a lot more on TV advertising than they do online. I don't know why, you know, why that is, I'm not sure. 
Um, but it, it's not that it's not relevant now. It's more, com but it is more complicated, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so from the firm's point of view, what the firm, from the firm's side, what it's deciding is how much it spends. And how much it spends is the sum of these TV, these T, which is the seconds it's buying for the advert, times the price of the advert. And so this price is going to vary, and we observe that in the data, and we can, we're going to use that price to calibrate some things. Um, but so the thing that we're going to, um, the firm is going to contract with an agency is going to give the agency this, this amount of expenditure and it, for which it's going to buy these seconds, but, the, um, but it's going to buy like the aggregate amount of seconds. It's not going to buy seconds, it's going to buy eyes. So the industry talks about it as you're buying eyes, which means one person seeing the advert. And so that price is going to reflect like the amount of eyes you get for that second. But then the advertising agency is going to solve the problem of allocating these to particular slots, right? And so that's like very close to the way the industry actually works. Okay, so this is a monthly advertising industry across all of Coke and all of Pepsi. So just to show, show you, like an aggregate Coke advertises lots more than Pepsi. There's a lot of variation over time. They're not advertising all at the same time. They definitely like Pepsi in particular has some campaigns where it advertises and then it doesn't advertise at all for a while. Coke you know, advertises much more often, though it definitely has periods where it doesn't advertise so much. The firms also, this is a bit harder to see, sorry about that, but the firms differ a lot in the strategies over advertising their regular brand and the diet brand. So Coke advertises regular Coke quite a lot, and also diet, about the same amount actually as each other, whereas Pepsi in this period hardly ever advertises its main variety, only advertises diet. We don't have a great explanation for that. This model doesn't fully explain why that's true. Um, you know, the preference, the parameters that we estimate will a little bit explain that. And we do sort of worry about whether we fit the data well, but um, we're just taking that as, as given the existing equilibrium and then asking how those strategies change when, um, the tax is when a tax is introduced. And if we have a ban, then what the ban ends up doing is we're, res we're banning just this Coke regular, just the sugary advertising. I mean, we're also banning Pepsi, but since it doesn't do very much of it, it, it can't substitute just doing it, but it's not having so much of an effect on Pepsi. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean there's, there's umbrella branding, right? You, you still advertise, you capture that in your demand model, right? Yeah, we're allowing uh, spillovers so between in brand, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. No, no. And there's huge spillover effects here. So we'll see that's a really important effect in the spillovers. So we're going to allow separate, you know, this Coke, these two Cokes can spill over to each other and that can spill over differently than it spills over to Pepsi, but it can still spill over. Yeah. That's an that, that's that. Where, as long as you have a regular, you, you count on advertising Yeah. That's another one to consider. Oh, I see. Don't allow any advertising if you... No, it doesn't sell a lot more of its diet, it doesn't advertise it, so it's just a, you know, uh, well maybe, maybe the... I was very surprised by... Oh, maybe, I haven't noticed that actually. Yeah, the, the, I think it's a quantity. Oh yeah, so the relativities of those is, yeah, the relative market shares, Pepsi is much more diet, that's true, yeah. So, that makes sense, and, yeah. So they've, they've done that, or they've moved in that direction already. Yeah. Exceeds 40% you don't have a, yeah. Yeah. You, um, you like to come up with tax systems that the government will never implement, though. <laughs> I mean, that could be a good tax system, and that's an interesting thing to show, but there's no chance that the revenue would agree to do that because that's really hard to implement for them. So, working at IFS, I'm very grounded in the HMRC, so I, we talk a lot to, to the tax revenue authorities. So we tend to try and think of taxes that they actually might implement. That doesn't mean we shouldn't think of, of optimal ones, but, and that's an interesting one, but yeah. Um, but so the, the, um, we do ban, so there is a lot of that, that, that's very important because 
like in the UK, we do ban advertising during kids' TV. And so there's a kids' cereal brand that's um, Coca Rock Pops, which has stupid amounts of sugar in it. And so the, gov the firm, Kellogg's, can't, ban can't advertise it during kids' TV. So they've invented a new kind of cereal that's absolutely revolting because it has insane amounts of fiber that are in the nutrient profiling score get it below the threshold so that it's allowed to advertise it, but no one would ever eat it. But the, but the label looks exactly like Cocoa Rock Pops. So it's a product that has a like 0% market share. It's one of the most advertised cereals. And it you know, looks exactly like their big brand, which is insanely sugary. So that speaks to, you know, in a way, if you wanted to implement this. And so it's also um, McDonald's advertises carrots. So there's all these McDonald's adverts that are like, come to McDonald's and eat carrots, but you see a Happy Meal in the background. So that's called an advert for carrots, so they're allowed to do it. So there are a lot of issues that we've talked about that in other, other work, but that aren't here. And so that, you know, to what extent, so that's where we allow the spillovers. And so we'll see some of the effect of that. Um, okay, so we're going to first think about what consumers do quite quickly, and then think about what firms do, and then think about uh, the role that advertising agencies play in, in simplifying the demand model. So demand.